A2. <laughs> to advocate for children and their families and for the work that you do uh, at home to help increase access to, to diapers and related supplies. Um, a few months ago, my staff and I visited the Minnesota Diaper Bank to help back diapers uh, for new parents in need, and that was an eye-opening visit. Uh, I learned that in Minnesota, close to 98,000 uh, children experience diaper need. Uh, that's, of course, 98,000 children too many. Uh, I'll tell you a story about just uh, one of these families that I heard about uh, in Minnesota. This new mom uh, found herself suddenly without a job and sought out food at a food shelter in her local community. And uh, during her visit, she asked for help for diapers for her, her baby girl. And luckily, the food bank had uh, a program in place, but that day they were out of diapers. Uh, the volunteers instructed her to return uh, to the food bank the next day. And when she did, she found herself waiting in line for seven diapers. For seven diapers that were supposed to last a week. And I, th I think we all agree it's a step in the right direction when you get any, uh, you know, any diapers. But seven diapers for a week is, is just... Uh, Woefully inadequate. I guess you need 35 diapers at a minimum, uh, given her daughter's age, and um, that kind of sort of sums up uh, the problem here. We really have to do better for our kids. Uh, we have to do better for these families. Uh, no parent ever wants to put her child's health at risk because they have to use reuse dirty diapers. Um, no parent wants to decide between putting food on a table or buying diapers. So uh, right now we just have too many families, too many parents having to make choices like that. And that's why the work that you guys do every day, um, I just, I'm sorry, I can't remember your name. Happy. Who worked for the clerk of the house. And she said that I was in public service for 33 years. Yes, sir. And now you're in public service still <laughs> in D.C. And you all are. And uh, what you're doing is uh, so brilliant and so needed and so right. Um, I want to thank you. I have three grandchildren now, uh, two of them who are still in diapers. And I can't imagine what it must be like for families to make have to make that choice. So um, uh, last year I did work uh, with Congressman Ellison here in the House. He's from my state of Minnesota. He's a terrific congressman. Uh, Senator Casey in the Senate who um, I think his whole career is characterized by his, his um, work on behalf of children. That's, that's who he is. And uh, we, we, we introduced the uh, Hygiene uh, Assistance for Families of Infants and Toddlers Act, and uh, our half it. <laughs> there. Maybe we should make it have a fit. <laughs> um, this legislation would create a demonstration program that would allow states, local governments, and nonprofits to test new strategies for providing diapers to low income families uh, who have infants and, and toddlers. So I just, you know, the goal, we know what the goal is. The goal is to make it 
so possible for families to be providing diapers for their kids so that they have nothing happened. no diaper ever has to be reused and so that these little kids, these babies, these toddlers can thrive. I think that's a pretty good mission, don't you? <laughs> so thank you again for being on the Hill today, keep up the great work, and uh, your being here means an incredible amount. Uh, your efforts to uh, fight for these, these children is very powerful. And being here is very powerful, so thank you. So thank you all for, join, <clears throat> for joining us this morning. I want to thank a few people. I want to talk very briefly about um, what we'll be doing, and then I want to move into letting our panelists speak. I want to start with some thanks. First, to the House staff that helped us to put this together. So, Abby Shanfield and Josh Stewart in Representative Ellison's office, Allison Dodge, Eric Anderson, and Bev Fido in, in Rosa Delora's office, Desiree Smith and Emma Mahabri in Representative Lee's office, and Beth Winkler, Rachel Wilensky, and Brianne Schmidt in Senator Franken's office. Also, the staff of the National Diaper Bank Network has done an amazing job to put this together, particularly Allison Weir, who we could not do this without. Thank you, Allison. I want to thank our founding sponsor, Huggies, and Arif Muzzle, one of our board members, for being here. And I'd also just like to take a moment to thank Robert Kimberly for joining us this morning. Um, we really appreciate you being here. So I'm going to talk very briefly. A lot of you have heard me tell the story of how I became interested in this and how I, like many of you in your communities, became known as the diaper lady. Right? I'm not the only person here who has that name. So. I'm a social worker. I've been a social worker as long as I can remember. And I was working at Yale Child Study Center doing community-based social work. So I went to people's houses and I went into houses and talked to them about the different things that were going on. And these were families who were either chronically homeless, had mental health issues, had substance use issues. There were lots of different problems. But what they had in common was a level of poverty in New Haven, Connecticut, in one of the richest states in the country, that people were living in such poverty that they couldn't afford a diaper. That their kids, when I would come there in the morning, I would see that they would very clearly been in that diaper all night and all the day before. I saw parents take diapers off, empty the solids out, and put the diaper back on. And all of this happened while I had young children. And what I was struck by every single day when I would drop my kids off at school was how easy it was for me and how incredibly difficult the systems we've set up to support families who are struggling are. And I think about all the time the way that um, you know, having a clean diaper, and every time you run into the store and buy a little something extra, something you forgot, a parent in poverty doesn't have that option. And so we need to think about every day the little things and how something as small as a diaper can make the difference. And the reason that I first started the diaper bank is because as a clinician, and that's what I was doing, I was doing clinical work with families, I came to believe that there was no clinical intervention for not having toilet paper. The only intervention was buying toilet paper. And so, a lot of my friends laughed at me, I don't know what the people who weren't my friends were saying. <laughs> and I, actually I do. Um, and I started the New Haven Diaper Bank. And that was over 12 years ago. And it was incredibly exciting. And over the last six years with the 
um, endless and ongoing support of our founding sponsor, Huggy, as the National Diaper Bank Network has grown from about 30 or 40 diaper banks when we first started to over 350 diaper banks across the country. And, and we are proud of every single one of them. And we are so excited to be here together to do this work because the truth is, as much as I've done this before, it is fun to go in and talk to your elected officials because it is truly democracy in action and it is an incredibly empowering feeling. So this morning we are very lucky to have a panel to talk about diapers and public health. I'm going to briefly introduce people. I'm not going to read their bios because you have those. Um, we have directly to my left Dr. Megan Smith who um, I'm first off proud to call a colleague and a friend, and we're very happy to have her here. She's an assistant professor in the departments of psychiatry and the Child Study Center in the Yale School of Medicine. She is the lead author on the diaper need study that Allison and I were co-authors on that so many of you have um, used when you talk about the issue of diaper need. So Megan Smith has really been a huge um, a huge supporter and, and really changed the face of the way that we do this work. Um, Joan Sperger is a nurse who we're very happy to have here and she's going to talk about how diaper need manifests, manifests itself in hospital settings with, um, with new families really from a nursing perspective and we're very happy to have met her through our partnership with AWAN. The Association of Women's Health Obstetrics and Neonatal Nurses. Did I get it? A1. We like that better. That's easier. And um, Gabe Ottieri is the Deputy Chief of Staff at the Baltimore City Health Department. And what is exciting about hearing from somebody in the health department in Baltimore is that Baltimore is really taken a different view. <coughs> Um, and looking at public health concerns that are a result of child poverty. And we know that that really changes the way that families are supported. And when I was looking around, I saw that he actually was a, really does understand basic needs, was a part of um, developing a vision plan for the city of Baltimore. And it's interesting because when I read about this plan, it reminded me of the issue of diaper <coughs> talking about the fact that only 20% of kids in Baltimore who needed glasses had them, and how something as um, something that we might think of as not such a big deal, like a pair of glasses, can make the difference between being able to read, being able to learn to read and not learn to read. And so we're going to be able to hear from him about how some of these issues are being put into policy in the city of Baltimore. Um, so we'll start with Dr. Smith, move on to, to Ms. Sperger, and then Mr. Ottieri. Thank you so much. Sorry, I'm, a, I'm an academic, so I have to have just a couple slides to share with you. but. Um, you know, so thank you so much for, for having me as part of the panel and just want to um, really echo Joanne's remarks. And, you know, for, for, I'm a researcher um, and do clinical work in, um, as Joanne said, the Department of Psychiatry and Child Study at Yale, where I work specifically with low-income parents. And I think a lot about poverty and parenting and mental health. And really it was meeting um, Janet Alfano and, and Joanne and Allison and um, through something called the Moms Partnership, which we started in New Haven. And the Moms Partnership was a collaboration with the, the Diaper Bank in New Haven, the National Diaper Bank Network, and many other community agencies that are serving families. And so as part of the Moms Partnership, we were examining the issue of maternal depression. So we were thinking a lot about um, depression in pregnancy and postpartum depression, but really depression generally among women and parents. And um, I think you know what's remarkable when you think about depression, just here I have one of the numbers to show you, but you know, about 68% of low-income mothers, single mothers, um, so primarily a lot of the mothers we work with in New Haven are single mothers, about 68% of them have really high levels of depressive symptoms. And so what the research I do is really thinking about um, ways that we can begin to alleviate depressive symptoms and really intervene around this, this critical issue of, of maternal depression. And so it was in this investigation 
that really we became um, very thoughtful about diaper need. And so we were working with women um, who were caregivers of children under the age of 18, so really a wide range of, of um, age here. And what we were tasked with is really collecting systematic data um, from women on their goals, on areas that they derive support from, and also we were designing interventions across the city based on this. And so with Jana and Joanne's help, and with actually the help of mothers themselves, um, we, I, I'm giving you this actually questions here, so these were the diaper need questions that we actually asked, um, at this point actually now over 6,000 women. Um, but the paper that we published began asking these questions with about 3,000 mothers. And um, so we had the responses to these questions, which was really the first time that we, um, you know, as clinicians, as a healthcare system, had started to quantify this topic of, of diaper need. Um, and so we collected you know, this information along with other variables around poverty, so other um, variables that looked at food insecurity, housing instability, transportation, you know, all the usual issues we talk about when we talk about poverty and parenting. And um, it was actually at that point that the mayor of the city came to me and he said, you know, I'm really concerned about violence and I want to know about violence and mental health. And so, you know, he asked us to really model some of these, these different variables. What's the relationship between violence in our city and a mom's mental health? So we started putting a lot of variables into models, looking at what was the number one predictor of a mother's mental mental health status after she gave birth. Um, and we put a lot of different things in the model, and so these are, this is actually, um, we did a lot of neighborhood modeling too, so we, tar we really wanted to understand diaper need by neighborhood, so we mapped our variables, and so the, these are neighborhoods in New Haven where the darkest pink are the areas with the highest diaper need. So on the left here you can see the areas with the highest level of diaper need. And on the right are the neighborhoods with the highest level of emotional health need. And what we started playing around with again for the mayor was we, we found no direct relationship between violence and, and mental health for mothers. But when we put things like food insecurity and, and housing instability into the model, and so we controlled from them, the number one predictor of a mother's mental health status in the postpartum period was actually diaper need. And it really, um, you know, again, we ran this model probably about I always say, you know, 13 times, because we, we couldn't, you know, I, I didn't really even believe that at first, but it was really, we began to operationalize poverty for parents, and what does poverty look like, and how do we um, think about it so that we can intervene on it. And so, um, again, this is, what, what these kind of statistical models say is that above and beyond housing instability, food insecurity, diaper need is the largest predictor. And so, what that um, really told us, and what we did was, of course, publish the paper, um, that Joanne referred to in the journal of Pediatrics. And so this paper summarized those results um, and, and co-authored with the National Diaper Bank Network. Um, and you know, just to summarize, we saw the 30% diaper need that we often talk about from, from other studies. Um, but we saw a higher need for diapers among grandparents, so grandmothers raising grandkids, and also among Hispanic families, so families that designated themselves as um, Hispanic in terms of race ethnicity. Um, we began in this discussion to really talk about what was the mechanism whereby diaper need impacts a mother's mental health. So, so how does that work and how does that look? And one of the, um, you know, one of the ways we've been talking about this is, is sort of a larger model that we talk about in, in neuroscience and when we think about how poverty impacts the developing brain, is that we think about, you know, on the left here, if we can really address these issues for parents, so if we can begin to build the skills of parents, um, so that includes addressing things like diaper need, addressing basic needs of parents, addressing mental illness, um, poverty more broadly. But if we can address these issues for parents, we are actually strengthening the skills for parents in terms of their own mental health and their own well-being, um, their effectiveness at being parents, so we're hopefully increasing the quality of parenting. And also, you know, as, as we hear about thinking about increasing their ability to um, be employees and be citizens more broadly. And so um, we know, of course, that poverty impacts the developing brain greatly and that um, diaper need has a specific role in this, um, which I just want to, you know, walk you through here just in terms of some of the, uh, what we know from the literature and, and science on it. So if we think about reducing diaper need, um, we think about increasing parental mental health. Um, through reducing stress, reducing depression, um, reducing very specifically parenting stress, 
if we sort of look at that longer term, because we're beginning to do this in our research now in partnership with the state of Connecticut, um, we could think about, for example, reducing healthcare spending in terms of psychiatric hospitalizations for parents, um, increasing compliance with, with medical treatments. If we think about the reduction of diaper need, um, increasing child health and development, one of the ways this works initially from infancy is that if we can free up some of the space in a parent's brain, so if we can address diaper need so that a parent doesn't have to worry about providing diapers for their child, we actually free up a lot of space in the prefrontal cortex for the parent to begin to really focus on attaching and bonding and that what we call maternal sensitivity, so really focusing on that relationship with their child. So if we can address some of those basic needs, um, you know, scientifically we know that that really opens up that space for attachment and bonding. Um, and so you know, when we think about this, it's giving parents the opportunity um, to do that and you know, looking again long term, we would imagine that that reduces the risk for um, a child's referral to the child welfare system. It also um, increases a child's kindergarten readiness and overall social emotional development. So that, that critical bond of attachment is so important. Um, and of course, if we reduce diaper need, we increase the economic opportunities for parents, um, for parents to attend school and to attend work. And so we're beginning in our research in partnership with the National Diaper Bank Network to really start to quantify the impacts um, across this model. So really to think about these different pathways, what we call mediating variables, and think about how we can design studies to actually quantify this effect that we hear so much about from parents. So um, you know, I hope to report more um, on that front very soon, but we're moving forward with a, a large partnership with our state to do that now. And the other piece I just wanted to highlight that we're doing as part of the MOMS partnership, and I think has a, a lot of potential in terms of when we think about clinical services or for the provision of social services, um, this is a picture, we, we actually provide mental health services in the supermarket in New Haven. So we've partnered with um, Stop and Shop Supermarket, that's of course a large chain, and they've given us space to provide mental health services. But the other piece that we do is we provide diapers and other basic needs to mothers, um, and this is in partnership with the, with the diaper bank in New Haven. Um, we provide these services to mothers when they come in to receive mental health treatment. So it's really an interesting way for us to incentivize um, you know, the utilization of preventative medical care for mothers. And I'm really interested in exploring that opportunity, thinking about, for example, well child care visits and the potential um, to use diapers as an incentive for mothers to bring their children in for immunizations or other well child care. So I think there's a, a lot of potential there um, as well. So I will conclude with that. And just here's our website for the Moms Partnership, where we do have more information on our research if you are interested in that. Good morning, and uh, thank you for inviting me to speak about this important topic. Um, everybody knows that babies need diapers, but diapers mean more than happy babies. A lack of fresh diapers can actually keep moms and families trapped in poverty. For mothers who are able to work, there's subsidized daycare for families below the poverty level. But many families cannot take advantage of this subsidized daycare because the centers require six to ten fresh diapers per child per day. Poor families may not have enough fresh diapers on any given day. If a family cannot provide these diapers, mothers can't send their kids to daycare and cannot work outside the home. Without daycare, these mothers are forced to stay at home and in poverty. Most of us have never had to think very much about getting diapers for our kids. But for those who live in poverty, diaper need is an ongoing challenge, not only to the physical well-being of their babies, but to the psychological well-being of the entire family. You might ask, why, why don't they just use cloth diapers? But cloth diapers require a large financial outlay for their initial purchase and require frequent, if not daily, laundering. Many poor people don't have their own washer and dryer or easy access to laundry facilities and rely on laundromats to wash their clothes. Most laundromats do not allow diaper washing for hygiene purposes. That leaves disposable diapers as the only viable option, and that option remains out of reach for many families. Lack of finances often forces the main provider in the family to make the choice between food and diapers. In some communities, stores keep diapers in locked cabinets because they're so frequently stolen. Because poor mothers cannot buy diapers in large quantities, 
the per diaper cost is very high. And this causes an endless cycle of frustration and anxiety and may lead to maternal depression. Since government assistance for mothers and babies does not cover diapers, parents must somehow find the money to keep their babies clean and dry, sometimes to the detriment of the family's financial health. WIC, the Women, Infant, and Children Program, provides nutritional support for mothers and their infants, and SNAP, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, supplies food stamps to assist in purchasing groceries. Surprisingly, neither of these programs provide diapers, as they're considered hygiene products and not essential. TAMP, the Temporary Assistance for Needy Families, is the only federal assistance program that can be used for diapers. But TAMP also has to cover heat, electric, water, rent, clothing, transportation, and other needs. <coughs> diapers seem like a luxury item when the most basic needs consume most of the family's income. My own state of Pennsylvania has diaper banks that help to fill the gap by distributing approximately 2,202,000 diapers annually. Since Pennsylvania has a total population under three years old of around 427,000, the need for diaper assistance is great. Uh, Pennsylvania State Representative Rosita Youngblood said, access to a reliable supply of clean diapers is a necessity for the health and well-being of Pennsylvania's children. Unfortunately, across our commonwealth and across this country, there is a growing epidemic as many families on fixed incomes are simply unable to afford disposable diapers. Pediatricians recommend changing an infant's diaper every time it's wet or soiled, and newborn babies require at least 10 to 12 diapers each day, toddlers about eight. With the average cost of a month's supply of diapers at around $100, parents are forced to make difficult choices about their family's financial well-being and their baby's health every single day. On average, the cost of childcare in Pennsylvania accounts for about 13% of the income of a person at or below the poverty line. Because they cannot afford to change their baby's diapers as frequently as recommended, mothers are cutting back on the use of their precious diapers and changing only when the infant has a bowel movement. And some go so far as to empty the stool from the diaper and put the diaper back on the baby. As you can imagine, this leads to diaper dermatitis, also known as diaper rash, as well as urinary tract infections. And in extreme cases, babies have been known to develop yeast infections and staph infections. If a baby contracts a rotavirus or norovirus that causes diarrhea, the problem is compounded exponentially. A baby with diarrhea can decimate the family's already short supply of diapers in a single day. Diapering is critical to reducing the spread of fecal-borne infections among children, as a norovirus can be transmitted in fecal material for 25 days after symptoms are gone. So wearing soiled diapers while fighting a fecal-borne virus can spread the virus to all who come in contact with the ill child and the continual contact with the soiled diaper can cause painful irritations. At any given time, 20 to 25% of American babies have a diaper irritation, and 10% may be severe enough to necessitate a doctor visit. Babies are presenting at well baby clinics and emergency departments with diaper dermatitis that produces blisters and bleeding sores caused by the buildup of ammonia and Discomfort from these rashes and infections leads to increased irritability and crying, which creates a stressful situation for the babies and mothers and can impact the entire family. Mothers become depressed because they cannot provide a more comfortable life for their baby, and the constant fussing and crying can lead to abuse. Depression about diaper need can make the mother angry and may make her lash out against the child whose needs she cannot easily provide. Incessant crying is a known risk factor for infant injury from shaken baby syndrome. Providing an adequate supply of diapers has a positive impact on parent-child relationships as well as maternal psychological well-being. Maternal depression can affect a child's performance in school because it impacts the entire family, including the children. When children do not do well in school, 
It affects their ability to succeed after graduation if they get that far, thus perpetuating <laughs> poverty and unemployment. Eliminating diaper need has a positive effect on the mental health and the general welfare and achievement of the entire family. In the greater Philadelphia area, diapers are provided on a limited basis by social service agencies, and many are distributed by the local branch of the national nonprofit Cradles to Crayons. Between November and December of 2016, I ran a diaper drive through the Mother Baby Unit Council at Abington Jefferson Hospital. We collected 3,057 diapers, which I delivered to Cradles to Crayons. When I delivered these diapers to their office, the director told me they had distributed 100,000 diapers just that morning. In addition to small donations like we collected in my department, they received regular donations from a multitude of donors, ranging from local families to corporations. Bank of America, Progeny Health, Destination Maternity, Cordial, and Allstate Insurance are some of the many corporations that have hosted diaper collections on behalf of Cradles to Crowns. They have also received large donations from Huggies and The Honest Company through their partnership with the National Diaper Bank Network. They partner with close to 300 various nonprofit human service organizations and programs throughout the Philadelphia region, all of whom have access to their diaper supply. In fiscal year 2016, Cradles to Crayons distributed 750,492 diapers on average, not including their large distributions out of our local um, office. In fiscal year 2017, the distribution is 517,120 and counting. Cradles to Crayons are distributed to partners <coughs> are distributing to partners daily when requested through their kid packs and from their partner shelf when partners come in to pick up kid pack supplies. They have also hosted two large-scale distributions for the past few years, when approximately 300,000 individual diapers are given at each distribution, and still the need persists. Tyler Conicello, a partner relation associate affiliated with our local Cradles to Crayons, helps local at-risk families and has shared some stories about our clients. While Tyler was conducting interviews, a mom walked in with an 18-month-old. Mom was visibly upset about recently losing her job because she had taken too much time off from work because her son had frequent asthma attacks. The relative with whom she was living told her to either pay the rent or leave. Her son was fidgeting in the stroller, so mom let him out. When mom took him out of the stroller, his diaper was sagging and Tyler suggested that mom take him into the restroom for a diaper change. Mom burst into tears and begged Tyler not to call children's services. When Tyler asked why mom thought that she would call children's services, she said that she didn't have money for diapers, so she couldn't change him. At home, she let him go without a diaper and would just wash out his clothes when he soiled them. Tyler excused herself and returned with a box of diapers, which made mom very happy and very emotional. This mom, who had been scheduled to enter a shelter, was subsequently called with a job offer, and her relative with whom she had been staying invited her to continue living with her. Now that she's back on her feet, she'll stop by to visit Tyler periodically and drop off a pack of diapers. She always says, my baby is potty trained now, but it was a pack of diapers that changed my life. Tyler received a call from a young woman named Crystal stating she had her baby early but could not get welfare. None of her friends or family members could help her because they had their own challenges. Tyler was able to supply her with diapers, clothes, and infant supplies for her daughter. When Crystal was referred to Tyler, she had been changing her baby with cut up rags and paper towels. Tyler helped Crystal for six months until she got on her feet and started working. Crystal keeps in touch with Tyler and calls on her for help when other girls she knows are on their own and struggling. Rhonda Bonner is one of our social workers whose clients include our postpartum moms at Abington Jefferson Hospital. Rhonda told me that she finds many mothers, especially those in the African American and Hispanic population, need assistance in providing diapers upon their discharge with their newborns. 
She helps provide diapers for the baby's first couple months, but mothers are on their own after that. Many make do with using as few diapers per day as they can get away with, and they get diapers from local food banks or churches when they can. Although diapers are sometimes available to them, most lack the financial resources to get to a distribution center. Most do not have a car and cannot easily afford to take public transportation to get the available diapers. Rhonda said that she most often sees mothers putting diapers on their babies that are a size or two too small, simply because when they can purchase diapers, the smaller the size, the more there are in a package. Some use tape to hold a too small diaper on their child when the provided tabs don't reach. She noted that the mothers are always wearing the exact same clothing every time she sees them. And one mother came into the office in the middle of July wearing a Christmas sweater because that's all she had to wear. These mothers are placing the needs of their children before their own to provide for their babies. In my own experience, there are many new mothers on our mother baby unit who hoard diapers in their personal belonging bags or send them home with their visitors. When the new shift presents a different nurse, the patients will say that they are almost out of diapers, so the nurse gives them a new package. When the next shift comes on, the scenario is repeated, on and on until the mother and baby are discharged to home. A quick scan of the infant's intake and output record will show that the baby could not possibly have gone through the amount of diapers that we know have been given, but give them we must. Providing an adequate supply of diapers helps to alleviate a bit of the stress for the new mothers, if only for the first several days of the infant's life. As a nurse who devotes my time and my care to these new families, I cannot help but worry about what the future holds for these babies and for their mothers. It is clear that diaper need is the cause of much distress to at-risk families. Diaper need burdens low-income families and particularly Hispanic families. Entire families are suffering from the effects of this most basic need. This is why diaper need is an enormous public health issue and must be addressed. Occasional donations of diapers to needy families are a band-aid on the large gaping wound of this <coughs> persistent need. To ensure that every child born in the United States has the best start and the best opportunity to rise, we must provide these necessities to those who so desperately need them. Um, Bill 1143 must pass. We have to provide these diapers to every baby, every family, every day. City of Baltimore's Health Department and our Commissioner, Dr. Lee Nguyen. Um, and I'm, I'm looking forward to talking a little bit about the work that we do with public health on the front lines. Um, you know, Baltimore has, it's in a really interesting situation. It's, it's the footprint of public health in Baltimore is, is huge. We've had a long line of, of, of great health commissioners. Um, we are the oldest health department in the country. Boston will argue with that. Wrong. <laughs> we founded in 1793. And as a result, we are a uh, very progressive, nimble health department that, that does a lot of really interesting things uh, to combat some of these issues that we're talking about here, some of the issues that underlie the, the diaper issue, the mental health issue, uh, the trauma issue, the issue of, of dignity. And so we're able to be early pilot, piloters were able to be pioneers of things like the need, like the syringe exchange programs um, and some of the other things that I'll, that I'll talk about in a minute. But I really appreciated the, the mental health training as, as being a starting point for us. Um, and I also, I, I, I want to tell you tell you all, you all a story about when I started at the health department and what really framed my experience. So I, I started working there, I moved to Baltimore from D.C. I started working in Baltimore in the health department on April 23rd. So if you think back, April 27th <coughs> was the funeral of Freddie Gray and the day that violence and uprising broke out in the city. So it was my fourth day. Uh, and so we spent, I spent my whole, much of 
my the second half of my first week in the emergency operations center with the commissioner and, and other senior staff working on what our response was going to be, what the city's response was going to be, and, and how we were going to um, ensure safety, how we were going to ensure access to hospitals, access to dialysis facilities, chemotherapy facilities, things like that, life-sustaining life treatment facilities. And as we're focused on, on this sort of clear and immediate need, we learned that because the, the CBS had, had been looted and, and burned and closed, and other similar pharmacies around the city had, had been similarly impacted, um, and, and so we're closed, that there were a lot of folks who couldn't get prescription drugs, who couldn't get diapers, who couldn't get groceries. And so we got to work, long story short, on, on coming up with a solution, and, and we used the 311 system, so if someone called 311, we would triage the calls and figure out what the, where the need was greatest, and we would make deliveries, was needed to be done. And in the first couple of days, we got almost no calls. And, but we knew there was a need. We knew that, that 13 pharmacies had closed. It was a, a pretty significant need. And so the health commissioner and I, we went door to door at senior living facilities uh, to let people know that we were providing this service. And as we knocked on, on all of these doors, we got almost unanimous in one of two responses. One was, what candidate are you here for? <laughs> and the other one was, is this another survey? I just filled out a survey. Which, you know, these, these folks weren't being mean or cynical. They were just expressing that when they see this, when they see the government, when they see the city, they see us as being there for us and not there for them. And Baltimore has a long history of of deep institutional distrust. Um, Oprah just, just had that Henry Lacks movie came out on HBO two weeks ago, and we've seen that great movie. But there's a, a long history of institutional distrust in the city, especially among the city's poorer residents. And what what that ends up doing is it is it creates a barrier between our most vulnerable and our resources. And so we've got to be, we've got to think a little bit differently about how we engage vulnerable because of the historical frame that, that so many of our residents, especially our most vulnerable, have. So in 2009, Baltimore City had one of the worst infant mortality rates in the country. It was, it was on par with third world countries in the midst of civil war. It was terrible. And, but at the same time, we had hundreds of, of service providers trying to reach that, trying to influence and move the needle on the infant mortality rate and bring that infant mortality rate down. But like we so often see, when, when hundreds of organizations are working in silos towards the same end, they're not effective in getting there, and, and there's a lot of a lot of inefficiency. And so in 2009, uh, the health department formed this, this citywide initiative called Be More for Healthy Babies. Uh, and what Be More for Healthy Babies did was it, it convened over a hundred different nonprofits, service providers, clinical groups in this infant mortality space and got them to move in a single direction. Said, this is our North Star and we all need to be working together to get there. And in the in the six years for which we have the data, seven years for which we have the data, the infant mortality rate has been reduced by 38% across the city. The disparity between black and white infant mortality rate has decreased by almost 50 percent, which is incredible. And the number of sleep-related deaths has decreased by 50 percent. And we do this by engaging this broad spectrum of providers, by doing home visiting, by sending the most credible messengers, by engaging communities in their own health, and it's it's been so impactful because of the, the frame of getting of getting into communities and, and working with people where they are. I'll tell you another, after the unrest happened, um, the, the federal government worked hard to try to, to, to look at Baltimore and look at ways that it could help Baltimore. And one of the things that it did was some money became available through the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Administration uh, for a, an idea called RECAPS, which was resiliency in 
communities affected by stress and trauma. That's the, the name of this opportunity. And what we did was, and this is under the same BHB New York Healthy Babies initiative, um, it was under that umbrella. What we did was we went, we started having community meetings in the areas around where the unrest happened, Penn North, uh, Sandtown, Winchester, and, and uh, Druid Hill area, uh, North Heights. And so we had these community meetings where we're engaging community members, talking about what they need, and the thing that was, that's the most impactful about this is we got $5 million over five years, and the city is, is programming about a sixth of that money. The rest of it is going to the, this community group that we built of community members who come to these meetings, we give them entire ownership and decision-making rights over how to spend this money. And we just help them build whatever they need to build. And the, the goal is focusing on, on building scaling community models to address trauma. And I look at something like a diaper bag program and think about the trauma that a, a family must go through when they when they can't afford to put diapers on their kids. And I, my wife and I are expecting our, our first baby in June, so I was doing that when we were talking before about <laughs> diapers a day. And that was a little traumatizing too. <laughs> um, but it's it's so much of, of caring for the most vulnerable, of empowering our most vulnerable residents is is talking about dignity, it's talking about self-determination, it's talking about making people stakeholders in their own, empowering people to be stakeholders in their own health. And it's, we've, we're, we've been working with, uh, we had some conversations with some folks from ShareBaby uh, about, <laughs> about uh, putting through legislation in, in Maryland to increase access to diapers. And it's just such a great intervention to provide a little bit of dignity and a little bit of empowerment. And so we're really happy to be here and supportive of expanding access to diapers in the work that you guys want to do. Um, thank you to all three of you. That was, that was really fascinating. <clears throat> and I think that having the opportunity to really look at diapers as a public health issue is an amazing opportunity. Um, certainly I have some questions to ask, but I'm first going to see if there are questions that people who are here listening to the panel would like to ask before I go into what I'm interested in. 